uh, very, very knowledgeable guys, I said earlier, so I'm not going to steal anything away from you because your time is better than me. Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. Today we're going to be talking about better results faster and in a regen setting when you have limited exposure with your patients. What do you think you need? Better results faster. Okay, so any nutrition experts in the room today? Anybody, if you raise your hand. Okay, so all right, one maybe? Maybe. All right, that's good. So today what we're going to talk about is basically how your patients have the ability to control outcomes in your clinic without telling you, okay? How they can turn human cell and tissue product on and how they can turn human cell and tissue product off. And if they can turn it off, you probably want to know how that works so you don't put $2,500 worth of tissue in somebody's knee and it not do its job, right? Okay, so we're going to talk about that today, obviously. Uh, here's a disclaimer and talks about FDA, et cetera. Here's my disclaimer. What I tell you is not going to create a doctor-patient relationship between me and anybody in your practice or me and you today. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. Okay, we can go forward then. So this is an image. By the way, before we get into this image, if you have not stopped out by the table out here and put your name on the list, and your email address, I will have somebody send you this PowerPoint so you can use any of the graphics, any of the research citations, whatever you want in practice, okay? So all you gotta do is just go out there and put your name on the list in an email and say, send me the PowerPoint, all right? All right, so this is uh, how patients get sick in the United States today. This is a gross generalization, and, um, and so I'm using obesity, diabetes, heart disease, whatever you want to think about from a chronic perspective. And one of the things you're going to find out today is that most of your patients that have joint degeneration also have a chronic inflammatory condition that is driving them down this cycle right here. In the United States, modern medicine in its great wisdom has said essentially, right, essentially that you are a victim of your own health, a victim. And when you have this victim mentality as a patient, all you're looking for is sympathy, and sympathy will fund chronic disease 100% of the time. There's this thing called empathy that I know you learn with AMI because these people have the ability to put themselves in your shoes, in your patient's shoes, and coach them out of it. Coach them out of it. So today what we're going to talk about is what empathy looks like from a nutrition perspective so that your patients don't have to follow this cycle right here. Right? I want, if you don't remember anything from today's presentation, I want it to be this, at least this. Okay? That chronic disease is the result of genetics plus lifestyle. Genetics and lifestyle. Your patient walks in and tells you that, hey, um, I have this condition, my dad had this condition, my uncles have it, my grandpa had it, my goodness, it's in my genetics, right? What do you do? Yeah, right, you agree with them. You reinforce, you reinforce the lie that they're telling themselves to make it okay, right? And what I want you to do is I want you to pump the brakes and I want you to smile and I want you to go, well, maybe. Okay. I want you to be able to say maybe to your patient with like some convincing, uh, convincing attitude. Okay, you got to be able to say maybe, and they look at you and go, "Well, what do you mean maybe?" <laughs> All right, and that opens the door for you to be able to help this patient turn their life around. And so we're going to talk about that today. So don't ever forget this. All right, lifestyle and genetics over a period of time is going to give you a chronic health outcome. If that's the way that chronic disease is built, including degenerative changes in your spine, your knees, your hips, your shoulders, your brain, right, including that, that means that this is also true, okay, that chronic health improvement is the result of your genetics and lifestyle. So here's the question, what goes into lifestyle? Does anybody know? This is like, let's participate here on this one, all right? So Dr. Carberry, what's a piece of lifestyle? Exercise. Exercise. So movement. We can talk about that. Diet. Diet. Okay. What else? Sleep. Sleep. What else? Stress. Stress. Mental health. Attitude. All right. What else? 
Environmental factors, like what? Smoke, toxins, alcohol, inflammation, yep. Energy fields. Energy fields, like standing next to this TV, right? <laughs> Not that one. Not that one, right. <laughs> he wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, environmental factors are huge. I want you to see that environment is part of your lifestyle. If you put something in your body, drinking, eating, or you put your body in an environment, all of that impacts your genetics. Okay, lifestyle includes your environment. And this is super important because what you're gonna find out is that inflammation ultimately is destroying your patient's lives. Inflammation, okay? So one of the questions that I got often is, is Doctor, how do patients heal? Like, what's the process of patient healing? And so I tr started to explain it in beautiful language, right? And your patients just look at me like, what are you talking about? So I drew this, this diagram, okay? And this diagram has helped thousands and thousands of patients, and I want it to help thousands of your patients as well, okay? So what is actually causing tissue to regenerate in somebody's knee. What is actually causing tissue to regenerate? Okay, here's the secret. Is that human cell and tissue product growing into a new meniscus sitting in the tube? No. What does it require in order to turn into new meniscus tissue? Right, it requires you, you. The electricity that allows you to like blink your eyes and wiggle your finger and your heart's beating right now, you're not thinking about it, right? That electricity is what is required to energize that human cell and tissue product, right? To like start unfolding the instructions inside of the DNA, that human cell and tissue product. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. A light bulb does not turn on until there's electricity in that light bulb. Human cell and tissue product does not turn on until it meets you, okay? So to the extent that you are energizing human cell and tissue product is to the extent that you can expect it to improve. So you have patients on a spectrum. Some patients that have wild issues with inflammation. Some patients that are running 5Ks and, and like taking care of their body over here. Okay? Different level of inflammation, different causes of inflammation. But that inflammation is really impacting their ability to heal. So let's say you have, who comes to your practice? Patients that are healthy, fit, and like, well, I did it, I hit my 100th marathon this year, <laughs> right? Or is it the patient that's like, you saw them, you know, with the, the donut at the gas station and the Mountain Dew and all the stuff, and they come in and they're like, I hurt. I don't feel well. Somebody help me. Who is it? Is it the marathon runner or is it that guy? It's that guy. Okay. So here's what's going on with that guy. His ability to heal, I call it, I'm a chiropractor, so it's innate intelligence is what I call it, right? So your ability to heal, this innate intelligence, is trying to put out 65 different fires on a daily basis, and there's no wellness in that. There's no wellness. Right? What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to harness the patient's ability to heal and fence it in, kind of like herding cattle or herding sheep. Okay? We want to be able to harness that and target it. We want to put it into a funnel and direct it. We want to work with your body's ability to heal. Okay? This is the promise of human cell and tissue product, right? is a blank slate. It's a blank, and it's beautiful. It's a blank slate. Right? But what it requires is innate intelligence to like tell it what to do. And when innate intelligence is trying to put out 62 different fires on a daily basis, it has no attention for the human cell and tissue product that you just put in your patient's knee. Okay? Zero attention. So building protocols is what this is called. And the protocol is the red wedge. This wedge is something that your patients will latch onto and they'll understand, oh, I have to guide my ability to heal. I don't just get to sit here and passively participate. They, gotta, they have to guide it, right? You, gotta, you have to harness your ability to heal. And so what we wanna do is we wanna start creating protocols that will put this 
innate intelligence into a direction instead of constantly like going back and forth and just pacing and, and wondering what oh, I got too many things to handle today right and now your patients getting gray hair they're getting overweight their knees are hurting they don't feel well they have brain fog right they can't remember the conversation you guys had last time they were in the office these are signs of inflammation this is signs of innate intelligence struggling to keep them on on track okay so if we can create a protocol, if we can create a wedge, and this includes your human cell and tissue product, this, re this red wedge does, on the other end of this is the promise of wellness. And I say the promise like a philosophical thing. I mean, you're not guaranteeing your patient, hey, here's 100% here's a guarantee you're going to be well. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when you get a cut on your finger and the edges of that cut heal together, what did your patient have to do in order to make that happen? right the the first answer you would say is is nothing but actually they did have to do something what did they have to do they had to stop cutting their finger every single day when they wake up all right they had to stop reopening that same cut and so i want to show you how we can stop reopening the cut that's causing the issues behind degeneration okay so get this picture we'll come back to it later but here's our main goal we want to decrease inflammation over time did you know that you have helpful inflama inflammation and hurtful inflammation in your body right now? And depending on which one you're funding, which fire you're fueling, depending on which fire you're fueling, you're either going to wake up tomorrow happy and excited because you feel like a rubber band, or you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to be depressed because you feel like you know, a piece of straw. Okay? This is what we're looking at. So decreasing inflammation over time is where it's at. All right, so let's talk about inflammation as it relates to uh, regen intervention here. Everybody knows that your patients are not supposed to be on anti-inflammatory pharmaceutical medications when they have their procedure taken care of, correct? Does anybody know why? That's right, all right. Does anybody know how? I'm gonna show you how real quick, okay? So here's what happens. Inside of a human cell and tissue product, innate in a human cell and tissue product, is the inflammation required to produce the result. Your patient could be completely uh, the lowest inflammation you've ever seen in your life, okay? But you put a human cell and tissue product into their knee and that injection goes in there, there will be an inflammatory reaction in their knee, inherent in that product. Does that make sense? Okay. On top of that, all right, the inflammation caused by your patient's lifestyle and environment combined with their genetic predisposition turns it off. Turns it off. All right. Have you ever seen a fire consume a fire? All right. Have you ever seen... Um, so like I live in Minnesota and it's fall in Minnesota right now. It's all like orange and red and yellow and it's like campfire season, okay? And so you get these campfires that everybody has in their backyard and you build a fire and you want it to be small enough that you can come up to it and, and like put your hands by it and it's comfortable, right? You don't want your kids to have to sit like 100 yards away because the fire is so big. Make sense? Okay. The campfire is inherent in a human cell and tissue product. You're introducing that to patients that have a house fire currently. Okay, I want you to think about this. So here's in 2007, a uh, research article says, and the citations are on the bottom, so when you get the PowerPoint, if you want them, just click the citations, okay? So in 2007, it says here that NSAIDs are found to suppress proliferation and induce cell death in cultured osteoblasts, so new formation of bone and joint tissue. And steroids were found to decrease the osteogenesis potential. The immune system suppressants suppressed the inflammation inherent in the human cell and tissue product. 2013, aspirin-like drugs could improve the success of stem cell transplants according to this researcher. Okay, well you look at that and you go, well that doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? Those are competing statements. And if you read through the research, what you're finding is that one, right, one 
was working on a mechanism to put out the campfire. The other is working on a mechanism to put out the house fire. Two different fires, two different inflammations, and you're going to know how, by the end of this today, you're going to know how to turn them on and turn them off, okay? So two different situations. So this is all about balance like a teeter-totter. Better results faster happens with balance between the two different types of inflammation. So everybody's heard of COX-2 inhibitors? Your patient's supposed to be on those? No, those are the, the ones that turn off what we're looking for. And so there's a trigger called NF-kappa-beta. NF-kappa-beta is, it's called nuclear factor kappa-beta. And what it is is basically it's like a light switch on the inside of a room. The room just happens to be the cell, okay? And when that light switch gets turned on, that light switch sends a signal to the nucleus of the cell that tells it to start manufacturing a whole bunch of inflammatory products, right? That nucleus, it breaks. All of those inflammatory products enter the room like I am right now, and it tells all of the other cells in its vicinity, it's time to get irritated, okay? It's time for you to get angry. And to the extent that your body has NF-kappa-beta reaction, driving COX-2 is to the extent that you sprain your ankle and it swells up when you're playing basketball. Okay? Is to the extent that you, uh, maybe you had a little too much to drink last night, right? And you have a headache, okay? This is the same mechanism that's going on here. So there's two types of inflammation that we're gonna talk about today. One's helpful, one's hurtful. NF-kappa-beta, this is for all of you. You don't have to know this. This is just reference if you want it later. You're like, how does that work, okay? This is a cascade of reactions. This is just like dominoes, lining them up here, okay? So NF-kappa-beta is triggered by something called TNF-alpha and it increases inflammation upon injury or infection. So one type of inflammation is supposed to be present in your body on injury or infection. Like you've seen patients that have had cellulitis before, okay? And they get this red hot spot on their shin or something like that. And that is a local inflammatory reaction. I mentioned playing basketball and you sprain your ankle playing basketball. If you sprain your ankle playing basketball, your head doesn't swell up, right? It's a local reaction. Your ankle swells up. If you sprain your ankle, your hands don't get swollen, okay? That's not how it works. It's a localized reaction. NF-kappa-beta is supposed to be a localized reaction, all right? It's like a match lighting the tissue on fire, just creating that little campfire scenario. Okay, does that make sense so far? Okay. NF-kappa-beta is the chain reaction that I demonstrated by walking into the middle of the room. Push the first domino, and when they're all lined up correctly, the rest of the dominoes fall. Okay, so the reason that you sprain your ankle and your ligament isn't the only thing that swells up, it's your whole ankle. Okay, it's regional. Because it's like a domino effect. If one cell gets irritated, it tells its neighbor, you should be upset right now. And if you're not, now I'm going to talk to this guy, <laughs> okay? And what happens is this uh, basically NF-kappa-beta chain reaction causes uh, joint tissue destruction. This is uh, a picture of, I'm going to show you a picture of a marathon runner in a second. This is what's happening in the marathon runner, right? Repetitive use injury, localized constantly because he's addicted to the endorphin reactions, okay? Two types of inflammation. This is a usage-related trauma. This guy is your dream patient. This is the guy you want in your office. Okay, so if you can figure out some marketing, Dr. Carberry, that puts patients that are 80-year-old marathon runners in all of these practices. Working on it. That's right. What happens is, is you see this patient, they walk in, they get their injection, they go through your process, they smile, shake your hand, and you don't hear from this person again but you get constant referrals from all of his friends in the running club, okay? This is your dream patient. This is who you want, right? This patient, he's not gonna bother you, okay? It's the exchange that you set up, he's okay with. He's not calling you every Tuesday going, well, I thought it would be working by now. What's going on here, doctor? And you're like, well, remember we talked about food, <laughs> all right? So two types of inflammation. This is the guy you want. The second type of inflammation is something where NF-kappa-beta, that's supposed to be a localized reaction, is no longer local. NF-kappa-beta went everywhere. It went systemic. Okay, so if NF-kappa-beta 
is causing inflammation after a sprained ankle in my ankle, what happens if NF kappa beta is now released and it's like coursing through my veins? Where's the inflammation now? Top to bottom, okay? So they get activated by these things called TLRs. TLRs trigger inflammation in the absence of injury or infection. Well, that's irritating, okay? Like if, it, if inflammation's gonna be driven up and magnified in the absence of injury and infection, your patients, like TLRs, there's not a lot of people that know what a toll-like receptor is and what it actually does, and it's based off of a bacteria in your gut, as you'll see here, okay? This is like the Wild West, and you come in with human cell and tissue product, right, to help your patients regenerate whatever the, t whatever the joint is you're working on. But guess where that human cell and tissue product goes? It migrates to whatever tissue is on fire the most in the human body. That is frustrating, okay? Very frustrating. Now, LPS are called lipopolysaccharides, okay? This again, you don't have to know this. This is just in case you want it later, okay? Lipopolysaccharides are a, a chemical produced by the bacteria in your gut Everybody produces lipopolysaccharides. Everybody does. Here's the problem. When you eat the standard American diet for more than a week, your gut bacteria start churning out lipopolysaccharides like crazy. They go into like wartime production, okay? And lipopolysaccharides are supposed to be these nice, tiny little molecules, right, that stay in your intestines. But if you're eating a standard American diet, what else do you have? Many people have gut inflammation. Right? How many patients do you have that are like, oh, I have diarrhea, I have constipation. I feel a little weird here, they're bloated, right? They look like this from the back and they turn to the side and you're like, whoa! <laughs> All right? That inflammation is surrounding their immune system, okay? And 70% of your immune system is in uh, the the gut here, basically, right? The gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So lipopolysaccharides that are produced by your gut bacteria cross the gut barrier into your bloodstream. This is where the demise happens, okay? Cross the gut barrier into the bloodstream. Lipopolysaccharides. Now, we have a body on fire because lipopolysaccharides trigger NF-kappa-beta. And F kappa beta is in every cell of the body. And remember, lipopolysaccharides are causing this without infection or injury. So now your patient's just eating the Doritos and you're seeing their inflammatory levels rise and their body is suffering under the weight of what we call hand to mouth, okay? Eating food they shouldn't be eating, all right? Now, lipopolysaccharides, okay, LPS, 50% of the U.S. population has a full-blown metabolic endotoxemia. This is what this means. They have an infection of lipopolysaccharides from their gut bacteria. 50% of the U.S. population. That's a lot. Doc, how many patients do you think have had regenerative therapy in the United States to date? I have no idea. What do you think, maybe like 100,000? 150,000? Between the two of them, they've, they've done in the last five years probably 150,000 applications. How, this is how big this marketplace is. What's the population of the United States? 320 million, 330 million, right? 50% of the U.S. population has this problem that's destroying the cartilage in their hips, shoulders, knees, ankles, spine, destroying their brain. Your marketplace is massive, right? It's just about the messaging to connect with these people. It's massive. All right, so LPS are produced by gut bacteria. Endotoxemia means this. It's from a non-genetic cause or non-injury related cause. That means it's lifestyle. So your patient can't show up in your office and be like, you know, uh, dealing with obesity or diabetes or heart disease and stuff like that and, and go, well, yeah, this, old football injury is what caused this knee here. No, it's not. 
Okay, that's not what the medical literature says. Okay, it's not. And this is important because it's lifestyle related. What's that picture I showed you when we first started? How do you take somebody from being sick or degenerated into a spot for wellness? Right here, this thing. Okay, this is where it's at. All right, now you uh, put together lipopolysaccharide production, leaky gut, and somebody that is eating at Chick-fil-A twice a week, Wendy's, McDonald's, etc. Because convenient is cheap, right? Or they're at home eating boxes of macaroni and cheese right now because they've been on lockdown and, you know, it's like $1.20 a box, okay? Two meals. What happens? This, right? The bacteria are saturated with saturated fatty acids and they start producing a toxic form of LPS. This is why your patients are sick, right? This is why they're sick. What that is, that's like, this is Elon Musk's flamethrower right there, the one that he makes, all right? This is, this is what's happening to your patients' bodies. It's like lighting them on fire. But remember we had NF Kappa Beta with a match previously? Well, this isn't a match, right? This is, the house is on fire. How? By flamethrower, right? That's how. This is your patient's lifestyle right now, all right? So this is where they're at. There's got to be a way to reverse engineer this, though, and that's really what I want to talk about because we want to get back to seeing patients like this guy. And ultimately, this guy, he might be two out of a thousand, okay? Not to depress you, okay? <laughs> uh, but this is really who you're seeing, okay? So this is a guy. I'm from Minnesota, and you always got to pick on Wisconsin, okay? <laughs> And this is from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, all right? This guy, look at that, what it says under there. Man eats 30,000 Big Mac. Does he look healthy? No, but he certainly looks happy, right? Right? So this guy's body's on fire, all right? This guy's body's on fire. This is who's coming into your office, okay? Guess what else? This is the guy that's going to call you in two weeks because you didn't build the protocol the right way. And he's going to be like, Doc, I just, it's, I thought it would happen faster than this. Right? And you're like, yeah, just give us some time, man. Stem cells and human cell and tissue product, I should say. What happens is, is that human cell and tissue product will take three to six months in order to start proliferating new tissue. Right? So your patient calls you after two weeks and is like, it's not working. And you're like, well, yeah, three to six months, man. Okay. And then he calls you next week. It's not working. He's going to keep calling you. All right. Why? Because this guy's willing to eat 30,000 Big Macs. Okay. This guy's willing to participate based off of sympathy. All he wants, he's calling you because he wants your sympathy. Okay. Are you going to give it to him? Or are you going to give him empathy on your first visit so that he doesn't call you? <laughs> okay. All right. So if we have regenerative support goals, they have to be this. We have to create a local environment for therapeutic progress. So we have to decrease lipopolysaccharides. And that dude's not changing his diet. Okay. He's not going to change his diet. They're not coming to you for a lifestyle change. You still have to tell them. Okay, you're going to support healthy tissue genesis, which means better collagen, better bone formation. Synovial fluid is the kicker here, okay, and cell membrane support. So therapeutic maintenance obviously is where we want to be at the end with wellness. But these are the goals. And so remember, if these are the goals, we have to have these as checkpoints along the way. You got 96 problems out here, and we move to 60 problems, to 30 problems, to 2. And the patient should be well at that point because you have taken and harnessed their ability to heal and directed it. You pointed it in the right direction. And it's awesome. It's one of my favorite things about being a doctor is moving patients through this cycle and getting them to understand that their body can heal if they stop abusing it. All right. We're going to talk about Biogenics Regenerative Support Kit because these two nutrients Biogemax PC, which is phosphatidylcholine, and vitamin C with our lipoic acid in it. These two nutrients have changed the game on patient care in a regen setting. Changed the game. And I'm going to show you why here, okay? 
These are going to be all the research citations that you can have as we go. Vitamin C is an antioxidant, and what that means is, is that oxidative stress, tissue breakdown, has an antidote, and what's it called? Antioxidants. This is a vacuum for inflammation. We want to put the vacuum into the cell so that it can vacuum up all of the garbage on the inside of the cell and we can have better cell turnover. Here is a normal ATP, you guys, uh, ATP production. You guys remember mitochondria from physiology? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, you breathe in oxygen, you eat food, you mash two together, you get ATP and you exhale CO2, okay? That's as difficult as it needs to be. Here is ATP production in the green. Here is free radical production out of a normal healthy mitochondria. Like I have a one and a half year old and this is what his look like, okay? And, and this is what it's like. The kid, he's got so much energy, you just look at him and you're like, I don't have it, <laughs> okay? This is what's going on. But over time and crappy lifestyle, we end up with mitochondria that are dilapidated. If you wanna know if your patient has dilapidated mitochondria, look at their face. Okay, do they have wrinkles? This is wrinkly as well. It's the same material, cell membrane, phosphatidylcholine, okay? Now, here's their ATP production. That's not very good. Here's the free radical damage. That's a lot, right? That's oxidative stress. Vitamin C that we use with this kit is a vacuum for all of that red stuff, the free radical damage. That is what's destroying the inside of your patient's tissue. All right, vitamin C. Very good. So it's got to be unoxidized, obviously, because if it's already oxidized, there's, it can't vacuum anything. Okay? So I just want to make sure with that. By the way, this is called, I tell this to my patients, all of my patients know this picture. Metabolic dust. The red stuff is metabolic dust. We want to vacuum up that dust. Okay? And that's what vitamin C helps us do. Vitamin C also is uh, one of the things that you want to note, precursor. So this is out of, who is this out of? Joint, bone, and spine in 2005. This is way back. Precursor to joint damage in almost 90% of cases. Subclinical vitamin C deficiency. Right? What do we call that like 100 years ago? Scurvy. <laughs> right? So why is this starting to show up now? Do you remember it like scurvy went away? Nobody had scurvy ever in the 90s. Right? But how come now it's showing up? Because we stopped eating food that was fortified with vitamin C. Remember all the cereals you ate when you were a kid and the bread and all the stuff? It had vitamin C in it. That was their marketing. Like, what now with more vitamin C? Okay? It's not like that anymore. Why? Because we're educated. And as a, a country, we're starting to eat food that is not as fortified. And now we end up with tons of joint destruction. So like negative side effect of not eating life cereal and white bread, right? <laughs> All right, so this is not injury related, by the way. So vitamin C, supplementation of chondrocytes after static loading has the potential to reduce the morphological and biochemical degeneration of chondrocytes caused by static loading. What does that mean? Remember when you get a human cell and tissue product injected into your knee, you're going to tell your patient to go out and do like box jumps? You're going to go have them do like squats in the rack in their home gym? No. What are you going to tell them to do? Chill out. If you've got to go for a walk, gently. Okay? Why? Because you don't want to create more stress, more inflammation that shuts off that human cell and tissue product. Okay? Vitamin C, right, reduce the morphological biochemical degeneration. So think pressure destruction of new cells. Vitamin C is that thing. Right? Here's the other problem with vitamin C. Your gut does not like to absorb it, okay? The amount you actually need in order for your joints to get benefit from it, you can't absorb. Did you know that? What happens? I mean, you could give it to your patient, but they'd have to sleep in the bathtub, right? Because they're gonna have diarrhea, okay? Less than 50% absorption rate in powder and pills, which is why we use something called the lipid model. It's called a liposome. And what a liposome is, is basically a bubble that we wrap the nutrient in. And this, right, is a fat layer that allows it to passively absorb. So you don't, doesn't require anything to absorb. You can put it on your skin and it'll get sucked into your bloodstream. You can put it in your mouth and it gets sucked into your bloodstream, right? Your skin is basically made out of those little blue and uh, yellow formations there. 
Okay, so this stuff's cool. So, by the way, remember we were talking about wrinkles? Um, my wife uses it here to keep wrinkles away. <laughs> I'm sure she'd appreciate that I said that. Um, <laughs> all right, so lipid model absorption here. We want to decrease inflammatory arthritis. Right off the bat, you guys. This is amazing, okay? Prevent osteoarthritis. Improve collagen formation. You're going to vacuum up that metabolic dust, and we want to have ideal levels of inflammation. And that's because phosphatidylcholine, those blue and yellow tails that I showed you there that we put the nutrient inside, is this stuff, phosphatidylcholine. And so instead of just giving you vitamin C wrapped in phosphatidylcholine, we have vitamin C and phosphatidylcholine so that we get this driven into the tissue. This is what synovial fluid is made up of. This is what makes it greasy and slippery, a zero friction environment, phosphatidylcholine. What happens when people have chronic disease is they start donating liver cells to create bile. Phosphatidylcholine is what they're creating, okay? Because we don't take it in in our diet in high enough amounts, your body starts sacrificing organs. Does that make sense? Like, do we wanna do that? We got almost 40% of American adults right now that have something called fatty liver disease because of this. They don't have enough phosphatidylcholine. Right? And so their liver has donated itself to such an extent, the liver's like, I got nothing, I'm done. Okay? And have fat infiltration and disease. Okay? Your patients, I promise you, are not going to spend phosphatidylcholine on making sure their joints are greased up when they have liver disease. 40% okay? of American adults. So phosphatidylcholine is an important part of what we do here. PC has been shown to increase secretory IgA levels, that means uh, gut immunity, to combat LPS. So if we got a vacuum for metabolic dust, we also have to have a vacuum for lipopolysaccharides, and that's what this is, okay? All right, so with inflammatory balance, if we have helpful and hurtful levels of inflammation, we wanna be able to maximize the helpful, okay? This product, this kit, does not shut off the inflammatory reaction inherent in the human cell and tissue product, okay? Doesn't do it, why? Because this is targeted. This is targeting the two things that are lighting your patient's bodies on fire. We're gonna vacuum up that metabolic dust, okay? Remember that. And we're gonna start harnessing your patient's ability to heal. Because this is really what it's all about right here, okay? All about this. Do you know there's no healing in nutrition? Do you know there's no healing in human cell and tissue product? Right? The healing is you. Right? It just needs the building blocks. And that's what you're giving them. Okay? Giving them the building blocks. So, all right. I think that's where we're going to leave off. And if you guys have any questions, I'll be out at the booth, obviously. But thank you for being a good audience today. Thank you.